President Trump has said that whether he runs in 2024 is still to be determined, being influenced by other outside factors, the biggest one of which will be whether the Republican Party takes back the House in the upcoming midterm elections. It is true that the sitting president's party always does poorly in midterms, aside from the unprecedented 2002 elections and the aftermath of the September 11th attacks, no president has been able to resist this naturally except for Franklin Roosevelt. History shows that the Republicans are poised to blow out the Democrats in the upcoming elections, and Republican performances in down-ballot races during the 2020 election would back that up. This video will be an analysis of swing maps, showing a wide range of scenarios for the 2022 midterms. Before that though, it's time to dispel with two notions, the first being the idea that this midterm will somehow be different, because Trump supporters will not show up if Trump himself is not on the ballot. This is wrong and based off of a faulty narrative that ultimately holds no water. The crux of this argument is the 2018 midterms, and in those 2018 midterms, the Republicans received over 6 million more votes than the previous midterm record, which is the 44.827 million votes that Republicans received in 2010. They received 10 million more votes than in 2014, another massive wave year. This alone should disprove the fact that Republicans aren't going to show up. 2018 was Democrats having more turnout than them, and that's all their gains were down to. To support this argument, people also point to three Senate races, the first being the 2017 Alabama disaster, and the second being the Georgia Senate runoffs. First, Alabama. This election had everything to do with Moore and not Trump. Moore in this election was more or less on trial for being a child predator and the allegations against him were viewed as credible by the Republican base. Another factor at play here is that the race took place in Alabama, one of the deepest red states in the entire country, and almost no one believed that Jones could win. If they realized that he had a chance, the debacle never would have happened. None of this is on Trump. None of this is on Trump voters not being motivated to turn out. Now for Georgia. Why Republicans lost at these elections is indeed down to turnout failures, but not because Trump wasn't on the ballot. That's an overly simplistic way of looking at things. The reason for these failures were due to the Republican base's disillusionment with the electoral system in the aftermath of a contested election that they believed was stolen from President Trump. They looked at this and said, why vote? This wasn't helped by people like Lynn Wood encouraging people to stay home. Oh, and McConnell waffling on the stimulus checks and pissing off most of the country and inflaming the Democratic base in the process also didn't help. To say this is them saying, I only want to vote for Trump, I'm not going to turn out for Republicans otherwise, is illiterate. The second notion is that the odds are stacked against the Republicans in this election because 1. They have completely lost the ball on white college educated voters, and 2. Midterm electorates are more educated than general electorates. Surprisingly, the latter of these is exaggerated to the edge of outright dishonesty. It is technically true, but very marginally so. The truth is, since President Trump became a force in national politics, this has become more and more murky. Here's a graph from University of Virginia's Center for Politics. This notion really only comes from the Obama years when you have absolutely massive swing margins because of well-educated voters turning out in opposition to him. Now, since 2018 and 2020 are not on this graph, I had to get them from CNN's exit polls. 2018 was 59 to 41 in favor of voters without a college degree. That's even less educated than the 2004 electorate. A massive change unparalleled in any of the numbers we see above, and 2020 was exactly the same margin, meaning that Trump's election years were 1% less educated and just as educated as the previous midterm. It seems that the Obama midterms of 2010 and 2014, where the majority of the electorate had college degrees, are ultimately anomalies located purely within the confines of that specific presidency. Now. It's onto those swing maps. I've prepared 11 total. Starting with the two-point swing map, this is the minimum that Republicans can achieve in order to flip any additional House seats. Given the fact that 2020's House elections were D plus 3, this is a D plus 1 environment, 
and the Republicans flip four seats, those being Iowa 3rd, Illinois 14th, Virginia 7th, and New Jersey 7th. This gets them to 217, one shy of controlling the majority. Don't fret though, this would be a historical anomaly. The three-point swing map leaves us with a neutral national environment, and this scenario is all it takes for Republicans to take back the House. Those seats are Minnesota 2nd, Wisconsin 3rd, Michigan 11th, Pennsylvania 17th, Georgia 7th, and Texas 15th. This map is basically a reversal of the current House, except with a majority that is larger by one seat. With the four-point swing map, Republicans start to really bust this open and begin carving themselves out a substantial House majority. They now sit at 230 seats, an average-sized majority comparable to the Democratic majority from 2018 to 2020 and the Republican majority during the middle of George Bush's presidency. They flip Washington 8th, Nevada 3rd, Arizona 1st, Texas 7th, Michigan 8th, Pennsylvania 7th, and Pennsylvania 8th. Worth noting that Cherry Bustos, who has received numerous votes for Speaker of the House in the past and is the former chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, is already on the cusp of being unseated here, but hangs on by the skin of her teeth on what would ultimately be hundreds or perhaps dozens of votes. Also, even the 1998 midterms in which the Democrats strangely gained seats the Republicans maintained a historically poor national environment average of 1.1%. We haven't even reached that point yet, and we've already retaken the House majority with plenty of seats to lose. In the five-point swing map, Bustos is unseated and is accompanied out of the door by Stephen Horsford. Republicans flip Nevada 4th and Illinois 17th. In the six-point swing map, Republicans pick up three seats all along the coast, including only their third bordering the Pacific Ocean. The other two are Atlantic. New Hampshire's Senate delegation is now tied. Republicans flip Oregon 4th, New Hampshire 1st, and Virginia 2nd. With a seven-point swing map in an R plus five environment, Republicans have now tied their seat total after the blowout 2010 midterms, which saw them flip 63 seats. Seven new seats are added, and Republicans completely wipe out Democratic gains made in Southern California in 2018, and now control Oregon's House delegation, strangely enough. Flips are Oregon 5th, California 45th, California 49th, Texas 32nd, Florida 13th, New Jersey 11th, and Maine 2nd. Eight-point swing map. Republicans are now one shy of controlling as many seats as they did after the 2014 midterms. Among the representatives unseated now is Tim Ryan. Realistically, though, this seat would flip a lot sooner because Ryan will be abandoning this seat to run for Senate. Interestingly enough, we'll be hearing about that on Sunday, so subscribe if you've made it this far. Flips are Illinois 6th, Ohio 13th, New Jersey 3rd, and New Jersey 5th. Nine-point swing map now. They've now arrived at the same total of seats as they had after the 2014 midterms and have finished slightly higher than the Republicans nationally that year. Only one seat flips here, G.K. Butterfields. This is an interesting turn of events because prior to 2020, his closest race was a 2010 nail-biter in which he only managed to secure 59.3% of the vote. Butterfield previously eclipsed 70% of the vote in other elections, so his ouster here is a bit of a shock. North Carolina first. 10-point swing map. This is an R plus 7 environment, and this is a red wave midterm, just slightly higher than the wave in 2010. Republicans pick up two more seats, and the second Democratic pickup in Georgia's suburbs has been returned to Republican hands. Flips. California 3rd, Georgia 6th. 11-point swing. Republicans now control over 250 seats, the largest House majority since 2009 and the largest held by Republicans since 1922. New Hampshire's delegation is now completely controlled by Republicans, and we're almost to the reverse of the Democrats' 2018 8.6% wave. New Republican seats, California 10th, Arizona 2nd, Kansas 3rd, and New Hampshire 2nd. We've now reached the penultimate map, Republican plus 9. In this scenario, Republicans pick up three more seats, including their first seat in Connecticut in over a decade. Minnesota Democrats are now limited to just Omar and McCollum in the House with Dean Phillips' ousting. Republican pickups, Minnesota 3rd, 
New York 19th, Connecticut 5th. Now it's time for the final map. This would be a historically good midterm election, and this is basically the limit for Republican hopes, representing a grand total of 261 seats in the House. Flips, Michigan 5th, Florida 7th, Florida 9th, New York 3rd, and New York 18th. And there we go, Republicans cap out at a total of 261 seats in the House. Now, as previously stated, this doesn't take into account gerrymandering, redistricting, or trends, so it isn't to be looked at as a holy grail. But if history is a guide, Republicans are likely to end up with at least 240 seats and have a majority as big, if not larger than, the one President Trump had to deal with in his first term. On top of that, it will be significantly better because the vast majority of rhinos are already out of office and Congress will be more loyal to President Trump than ever before. After 2022 comes and the treacherous 10 are cleaned out, along with others, whichever Republican is elected in 2024 will be in a better position than Trump initially was. The only thing left to clean up is Republican leadership. John Boehner and Paul Ryan are gone, but Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell remain. However, that's a topic for another video maybe even two videos. Perhaps two videos to come soon. If you've gotten this far, please like, subscribe, and share because it helps spread the word. This has been the Yankee Perspective. Thank you for watching.